Without further ado, Gabriel, would you introduce our speaker today? Well, Kai, uh, I want to formally welcome you to our Oakmont Sunday Symposium. Uh, we are really honored to be the venue of your first public talk on your forthcoming biography of Jimmy Thank Clark. You. I think everyone here probably knows that your Pulitzer Prize winning account of Robert Oppenheimer. Um, uh, I'm not sure that everyone knows that you also did uh, prize winning biographies of John McCoy, McGeorge Bundy, William Bundy, and our spy in the Middle East, Robert Ames, as well as your memoir of growing up among Arabs and Israelis. And Lynn and I would like to offer you belated congratulations on your appointment as the executive director and distinguished lecturer of City University of New York's Leon Levy Center for Biography. Yes. Um, my wife, Lynn and I, were privileged to get to know you in Nepal when she worked for your brilliant and beautiful wife, Susan Goldmark at the World Bank. <laughs> we discovered you were not only an incredibly disciplined- I worked for her too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, we discovered that we couldn't talk to you before, what was it, one in the afternoon because you were absolutely disciplined and meticulous writer. But as we've seen already, uh, you got a great sense of humor and have a fun loving family. And we, we all of us shared a love of Kathmandu's Nepalese and French cuisines. Thanks for joining us, Kai. Over to you. Thank you, Gabriel. It's a real pleasure to be here and a pleasure to see you. You know, I met Gabriel first in 1973 in Kathmandu. Um, I was a very young, I, I'd just gotten out of college and was trying to make my way in the world of journalism and freelancing. And I landed in Nepal and of course ran into Gabriel. Um, anyway, Kathmandu was a great place to write when Sue and I lived there for four years. And uh, I was then working on a, a memoir about growing up in the Middle East called Crossing Mandelbaum Gate. But we're here to, today to talk about Jimmy Carter. Um, my biography of him is six years in the making and it will be out June 15th. But I thought I would begin by uh, reading a short little opinion piece that I've scribbled uh, that sort of gives a I think is a nice introduction, and then I'll, I'll go to sort of talking about the, some of the stories from the book. Uh, so, dead is better. That is the opinion of most working biographers when asked if it is easier to write about a living subject or the long departed. In my 40 year career as a biographer, I have done both the living and the dead, and twice I have started my research with a subject very much alive, but by the time I had finished, I had killed them off. <laughs> the living invariably manufacture obstacles. Irrationally, they have the expectation that it is their life, so they try in some way to keep the biographer on a leash. My first subject, John McCloy, the powerful but secretive Wall Street lawyer, actually tried to persuade my editor to cancel the book contract. So six years ago, I informed President Jimmy Carter that I had signed a contract with Crown Books to write his biography. Uh, I didn't ask his permission or anything, but uh, a month later, he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And I thought, well, I'll never see him. But Carter miraculously survived and we eventually had a series of interviews. He wasn't a terribly talkative interviewer, uh, if only because he's not the kind of man who can waste time wandering down memory lane. Even at 91 then, he's now 96, Jimmy Carter was intensely focused on his work with the Carter Center projects that included wiping out Guinea worm disease in Africa and monitoring the Syrian civil war. I tried hard to get him to recall colorful anecdotes from his boyhood or White House years. I'd try to jog his memory with White House memos dug out of his presidential library, but usually he had little to add. 
he had kept a 5,000 page diary, 5,000 pages during his presidential years. And he published about 20% of those diary entries in a book called White House Diary. Naturally, I asked for permission to see the full diary. He gently declined, explaining that the diary still had to be reviewed for classified material. And too many people mentioned in the diary were still alive. That was his excuse. The full diary will eventually be opened in the Carter Presidential Library, but that will be after he's gone and long after my biography comes out this summer. As I said, dead is usually better. But it is also true that the living sometimes open closet doors that the dead cannot. In one of my early interviews with Carter, I asked him about a man named Charlie Kerbo his personal lawyer of many decades and perhaps his most tr trusted confidant. Kerbo had died in 1996, but I knew that he had recorded an oral history interview years earlier in which he described writing hundreds of personal memos to Carter during his White House years. I told Carter that I had found very few of these memos in his presidential archives. Carter expressed surprise and confirmed quote, Charlie wrote me all the time. So where were the Kerbo papers, I asked. This genuinely piqued his interest and he promised to look into the matter. Three days later, I received a phone call from Dr. Stephen Hockman, Carter's longtime personal aide. Hockman said they had found four boxes of Kerbo's papers in his widow's attic. Six months later, I was escorted into a back room of the Carter Library. Lying on the floor were all four boxes containing hundreds of letters and confidential memoranda. No other historian had ever seen these papers, many of them dating back to 1962 when Kerbo rescued Carter's early political career by proving that his state Senate opponent had stuffed, literally stuffed a ballot box in one, of, in one Georgia county and stolen the election. Anyway, the Kerbo papers proved to be a biographer's treasure. They gave, me pre gave my presidential biography a unique authenticity. Kerbo told Carter how to run as a populist. Remain moderate, he said, and progressive at the same time, he told Carter in one memo, and therefore attractive to anyone who is interested in you on the national ticket. Kerbo was the only member of Carter's inner circle who could reprimand the president. I usually know, Kerbo said, what he's going to do before he does it. But Kerbo was always discreet. Quote, Kerbo speaks only to Carter, quipped one aide, and Carter speaks only to God. <laughs> Charlie Kerbo is not a name known to most Americans. In his time, Kerbo was known as an influential political fixer who spoke with a thick molasses South Georgia drawl. Friends often compared him, his calm demeanor and measured gravitas to Atticus Finch, the trial lawyer in Harper Lee's 1960 novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. Kerbo's relationship with Carter turns out, in my view, to explain much about Carter himself. As a biographer, therefore, I will be forever grateful to Carter for finding Kerbo's papers and allowing me to quote freely from them. So perhaps sometimes writing about the living is better. <laughs> so that's my sort of little introduction. And then I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, talking about how I came to this project and what I sort of learned about Carter and his presidency. So why Carter? Um, you know, after writing four biographies about major sort of political figures from behind the scenes, people like John McCloy and McGeorge Bundy, who was national security advisor to Kennedy and Johnson, and, uh, a major architect of the war in Vietnam. These were people who were uh, sort of power brokers, but not household names necessarily. Anyway, so after doing these figures, I sort of had come to the conclusion that I ought to try to do a president because obviously almost any president is a household name and is known and it's a big canvas. Um, 
I confess, initially, I, I thought I wanted to do a biography of Ronald Reagan. And so I flew out to the Reagan Library and spent two weeks going box by box, folder by folder through his papers. But it turned out that 85% of Reagan's papers were still classified or closed for one reason or another. And the more I dug, the more I realized that Reagan didn't write very much. There, were, there was very little personal correspondence. There was, in fact, very little back and forth memos between Reagan and his White House aides. He worked very hard on his speeches and his little note cards for his talking points when he'd go on TV. But that was about it. And I began to get sort of more and more depressed at the thought of waking up every morning to face Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and uh, the sources just seemed not very rich. So I then went back to an idea I'd had actually 25 years earlier in 1990, after finishing my first biography of John McCloy, uh, I was casting around for a new book project. Carter had been out of office for 10 years and he had just started the Carter Center. And so I told my, one of my mentors, the editor of The Nation magazine, Victor Navasky, that I was thinking of doing a, a book on Jimmy Carter. And his response was, well, you should do a, an article for us, for The Nation, about his ex-presidency, what he's doing with his life after the White House. So I went down, I agreed, I do everything that Victor tells me to do. And I, so I went down to Atlanta and spent two weeks and interviewed a bunch of the new hires at the Carter Center um, and had a phone interview with Carter himself. And I wrote a cover story for the nation about what a great ex-president Carter was turning out to be. But I realized from that trip that Georgia for all practical purposes was a foreign country, at least for me. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I could hardly speak the, I could hardly understand the language, the accent. I didn't understand anything about race in the South. I didn't understand Southern Baptists. Uh, and I realized that if I was to do this, I'd have to probably move to Plains, Georgia, population 650, and spend a couple of years sort of living like a foreign correspondent in South Georgia. And uh, when I broached this notion to my lovely wife, Susan, uh, she said, well, you can do that, but I'm not going down to South Georgia. <laughs> and uh, so I put the whole idea on the back burner and decided that, you know, maybe I wasn't the guy to do Jimmy Carter. But I came back to it in 2015. He, I've always been fascinated with him because he's, his presidency in particular, you know, he came out of nowhere from Georgia, ran this exceptional campaign, and his presidency was only four years. He did not get reelected, but it was a sort of tipping point. Uh, in American politics and history between the old Democratic Party of Fr Franklin Roosevelt and the sort of neoliberalism of uh, later Bill Clinton. And it was a tipping point into a much more conservative country under Reagan and then Bush, the two Bushes. And uh, all sorts of issues in his presidency are still highly relevant today. The energy crisis of the 1970s, race, uh, the role of religion in our politics, climate change, healthcare, all of these were right on the front burner of Carter's presidency. And then you, you think about uh, what happened to Jimmy Carter with uh, the Iran hostage crisis and the, the revolution in Iran, well, we're still grappling with that today. We're still grappling with the Israel-Palestinian conundrum, which Carter was deeply involved in. 
And uh, we're still grappling with the issues in foreign policy of how to balance uh, human rights with this notion of American exceptionalism and the American empire. Um, anyway, I found all, I, I still believe, and I think my biography um, is relevant for this reason today is that all of these issues that were so important to Carter's presidency are still with us today. Finally, it's also a, just a great story because of the cast of characters. Recall Miss Lillian and her interviews on the Johnny Carson show, or Billy Carter and his Billy Beer escapades, uh, Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell, the two young aides who virtually ran the White House in their 30s, Bert Lance, and then Big New Brzezinski, the national security advisor. These are all very colorful, highly opinionated individuals. And I had a lot of fun, I have to confess, writing about them in this book. Finally, it's important to sort of demythologize uh, the Carter presidency. You know, the, the impression most Americans have of Jimmy Carter was that Oh, he, he's a decent guy, a nice guy, uh, a great ex-president, but he had a failed presidency. Well, actually, um, when you get into the Carter archives and deal with what was crossing his desk and how many pieces of legislation he signed, it's an, an incredibly active four years. He he inaugurated the legislation that led to seat belts and airbags, saving 10,000 American lives a year. He deregulated uh, air, the airline industry, which allowed middle-class Americans for the first time to start flying on a regular basis. Instead of driving on Thanksgiving or Christmas, they could hopped on an airplane. This hadn't happened before. He deregulated the trucking industry uh, he deregulated the natural gas system, which will eventually led to uh, our current energy regime of virtual energy independence. He, uh, in a small way, he opened the door to the boutique beer industry so that every city in America today has its own uh, boutique beer brand instead of sipping Budweiser, we have much better beers. I think that's a major accomplishment. <laughs> um, he also passed the Alaska Land Act, tripling the size of the nation's protected wilderness areas. He appointed scores of African Americans, Hispanics, and women to the federal judiciary, literally appointing more minorities to the federal bench than all presidents combined before him. He appointed Paul Volcker to the Federal Reserve, knowing that Volcker was going to uh, jack up interest rates and kill inflation, but at great political cost to his own reelection, uh, his own reelection uh, efforts. Uh, he also inaugurated what is known today as the modern vice presidency. Uh, you know, his vice president was Walter Mondale, of course, but for the first time, Mondale had an office in the White House right down the hall from the Oval Office. Uh, for the first time and ever since, uh, vice presidents have had an office in the, in, in the White House and they've had access to classified materials and, uh, you know, are generally considered to be full partners. This had never happened before. Carter made it happen. In the world of foreign policy, he uh, passed the Panama Canal Treaty. He negotiated the SALT II Arms Control Treaty. He normalized relations with China. He uh, started immigration reform that opened America's doors to political asylum which has now become very controversial, but Carter was the one who did that. He also uh, in, it made human rights uh, a key component of our whole foreign policy posture. Uh, 
you know, with some hypocrisy, with some uh, inconsistency, but he genuinely believed in it. And uh, it's never been able, you know, no, none of his pre successors have been able to walk away from human rights as an issue. And Carter's emphasis on human rights in both the third world, but also the Eastern Europe and Russia, I believe, and I argue in the book, planted the seeds actually for the end of the Cold War and was responsible for the end of the Cold War in a far more significant way than Reagan, who usually gets the credit for jacking up the defense budget. Um, Anyway, the, the, and then finally in the field of foreign policy, his probably major accomplishment was Camp David, the Camp David Accords that uh, led to a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. Um, you know, that, that was an incredible achievement and it was all due to the personal diplomacy of Carter taking these two cantankerous, difficult heads of state, Begin and Sadat, to Camp David for 13 days and forcing them to come to some terms. Uh, you know, the, the Camp David Accords and the subsequent treaty you know, took Egypt off the battlefield for Israel, an enormous achievement. Uh, but, Carter's failures as a president are really just as interesting. And Camp David is, is one of them. You know, he, he got the he, he, Israel-Egyptian peace treaty through, but he was not rewarded politically at all for this accomplishment. Instead, he lost a majority of the Jewish vote for the first time for a Democrat. He alienated Jewish American leaders why? Because he had insisted on a freeze on the settlements in the occupied territories in the West Bank. And in Carter's view, Menahem Begin reneged on his promises to have a five-year freeze of all settlements. Um, this is very controversial, but I argue based on new documents found in the Carter Library and Carter's own diary that he at least really believed that Begin had promised a five-year freeze. Um, and we all know now that instead of a freeze, they went on a building spree, building new settlements in the West Bank, which has led to our current predicament where there's no peace, there's continued conflict. And uh, the idea, the whole idea of a two-state solution, a political compromise, a territorial compromise is quickly receding and, and Israel is gonna be faced with a one-state solution, which is gonna have uh, all sorts of problems associated with it. So in retrospect, Carter, you know, was, was right, but he paid dearly for the Camp David Accords. And he was prophetic in his critique of what was happening with the settlements in the occupied territories. But it's still, I think, a terribly misunderstood chapter. Uh, he also had, and perhaps his most glaring failure was the Iran hostage crisis where you know he was a victim of the Iran revolution and uh, the revolution happened on his watch. Uh, there's really nothing he could have done to have prevented the revolution. It was an organic thing inside Iran. And uh, he, most notably, he resisted for months and months the idea that uh, the Shah, the deposed king of emperor of uh, Iran, the Shah should be given political asylum in America. Carter refused to do it for months and months, worrying that if he did so, he mused in his diary at one point that this might lead to hostage taking or a seizure of the embassy. It was very Prussian. But finally, in the end, uh, he was faced with a, again, what is not understood, and my book reveals this in great detail based on uh, 
uh, archival documents, uh, a organized lobbying campaign by Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, and John McCloy, the subject of my first biography. Um, they, they lobbied every week, the White House and members of the Carter administration to give the Shah asylum. They organized this into a uh, highly well-funded uh, lobbying campaign that they dubbed Operation Alpha. And we have the documents now from Operation Alpha. And they literally on a calendar um, assigned Henry Kissinger or David Rockefeller or some other member of their team to call up the president to lobby his national security advisor to give the Shah um, asylum. And finally, Carter succumbed in late October of 1979. Uh, and of course, this led to the seizure of the American embassy in Tehran and a 444 day hostage crisis. And Carter, again, um, you know, you can credit him with handling it well, refusing to use military force, uh, which was what Brzezinski wanted him to do, impose a naval blockade or mine the harbors. Uh, but Carter's first priority was to rescue the, the hostages all alive um, through diplomatic negotiations. And of course, this proved to be extremely politically costly. He resisted using force and then late in the game, in the spring of 1980, well into the hostage crisis, he was talked into a very high risk helicopter rescue mission by Zbig Brzezinski and some of the generals who all assured him that it was a uh, well-organized plan. In fact, it was, uh, doomed to failure. It was so complicated. It had so many moving parts that uh, it was, if they had actually gotten the helicopters, you know, recall the several of the helicopters had to turn back. And so Carter routinely, when he's asked about any of his regrets about his presidency, he says, oh, I think I should have sent in two more helicopters in my, my rescue. Uh, mission. Um, even if that had happened, uh, it's clear that the the mission would have gone awry once they landed in in Tehran in the embassy compound. There would have been dozens of people killed, probably many of the hostages themselves. Uh, anyway, it was a it was a doomed mission, and this, of course, also virtually killed his chances of getting reelected. Um, Finally, you know, he also, he, he failed in his attempt to get reelected because not only of the Iran crisis, not only because of stagflation and long gas lines, uh, not only because Ted Ken Kennedy mounted a challenge to him to try to take the nomination for the Democratic Party away from him. And that greatly weakened his, his campaign even after defeating Kennedy. But there, people forget that there was something called the October Surprise. And again, this is one of the revelations in my book. Uh, the October Surprise, we've had several October Surprises. In 1968, Nixon had an October Surprise where he secretly behind the backs of the Johnson administration was negotiating with Vietnam, North, the North Vietnamese. Um, but in 1980, there was also another October surprise in which the allegation is that Ray, Ronald Reagan's campaign manager, Bill Casey, who later became appointed CIA director, uh, met with a, a representative of the Ayatollah Khomeini in the summer of 1980 and uh, promised them a better deal that Ronald Reagan could give you a better deal. You don't have to negotiate the release of the hostages with Carter. He, in, in essence, is the allegation that he pro prolonged the hostage crisis by this secret diplomacy. Um, and I, I have 
you know, the evidence is murky and complicated, but I have found, I think, compelling documentation that Bill Casey actually did go to Madrid, Spain in the summer in July of 1980 and met with the representative of the Iranian revolutionary regime. It's a shocking allegation and stunning and, you know, treasonous. Um, so, that's his presidency. Uh, it's, it's a uh, mixed bag, it's a tragedy, it's a, a story of uh, incredible accomplishments. He changed America in many ways, uh, but it's also a tale of tragedy and failure. Um, the book also, I wanna say before I end, Carter himself is quite interesting. He's, he's much more complicated than people think. He, I argue he's probably the most intelligent, certainly the hardest working and the most decent man to have occupied the Oval Office in the 20th century. He, uh, he's still, even at 91, 92, 93, even last year, he's still an intimidating personality. Uh, those bright blue eyes are piercing. They're still, they reek with intelligence and impatience with uh, stupid questions or familiar questions. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's an amazingly focused man who wants to do good. Uh, this comes from his religion, from his Southern Baptist uh, faith. Um, and he's, and he has an, uh, an attention span that is uh, just remarkable. When he was in the White House, he was criticized for paying too much attention to detail uh, to the extent of famously, uh, he, he was alleged to have uh, supervised the schedule for the White House tennis court. Actually, that's not true, but uh, it is true that he would read on average about 300 pages a day of memos. And you can see this in the archives. You can see in the margins, his handwriting, his questions, his comments, um, some of them quite acerbic. Um, and I regard this, particularly after the uh, last president we had in the White House, as a uh, badge of honor. You know, we want our presidents to be hardworking and intelligent and paying attention to detail. Um, and that's exactly what Jimmy Carter did in the White House. So I argue in the book that history will judge Jimmy Carter as a president well ahead of his times, as prescient and, and sometimes even prophetic. Um, and I all urge you to run out and pre-order this book. It's a good read, it's a fun read, and uh, it has some controversy in it. So on that note, I'll, I'll stop um, chattering and um, take questions from you all. I thank you very much. That was quite exciting. Uh, we are looking forward to the book. Um, uh, and uh, remind everybody, if you want to ask questions, best way to do that is to use the chat. And if Jeff and Judy would keep their eyes on the chat for me, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, Kai, this is sort of a little diagonal to your, your talk and your book, but uh, I've always been intrigued by how the audio books get put together. And the reason is because quite frequently, the quality of an audio book is based in part on the reader, as well as the quality of the underlying material. So since you've recently gone through this process, uh, uh, can you give me a very brief summary of how that process actually works for you? Do you get, a, do you get to help pick the person? Do you interview them? Do you, do you discuss the book with them? Uh, actually, on this occasion, they just assigned me a audio book reader, a professional book reader whose business, he runs a little business, I believe in California. Um, and he uh, sent me an email saying that he had been chosen to read the book and he was looking forward to it. And uh, as, it, it <coughs> as he got closer to the time when he's actually gonna do the work, um, he emailed me and with a list 
every few days as he was sort of previewing the book of names and words that he thought were hard to pronounce or had questionable pronunciation. And he wanted to make sure that he was pronouncing these names correctly. And so he would have me uh, answer by calling his voicemail and actually dictating uh, into his voicemail the, what I thought was the correct pr pronunciation. But that's been the extent of my uh, involvement and the audio book, as I understand, is now done and will be ready for release on June 15th. It can be pre-ordered as well. Yes. Uh, have, have you listened to it? No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask one more question then. Um, Carter came into the presidency as someone who was not a Washington insider, okay? And that has been one of the complaints about Obama's presidency as well, that, that to some extent, uh, um, Carter did not accomplish everything he might have accomplished because it took him time to get his feet on the ground. And in one particular case, uh, uh, I followed sensitively the uh, appointment of Bill Miller to run the Federal Reserve, who was probably uh, a great contributor to our stagflation, or at least that's a often financial opinion. Um, what are your feelings about uh, his ability to land running when he became president? Well, he he certainly was an outsider, and you know the book is called the the outlier, <laughs> so um, for exactly that reason, he was an outlier. Um, both in terms of his personality and his intelligence and, uh, and where he came from. You know, he was the first president from the deep south to emerge in 140 years. Uh, and it's true he had no experience in Washington. He'd been a one-term governor. Uh, you know, when soon after he was elected in November of 1976, he was staying in Blair House across the street from the White House, and he and Fritz Mondale uh, were walking together to the White House across the street to have a, their first visit post-election with Jerry Ford. And uh, Carter turned to Mondale and said, uh, so what's it like? And Mondale said, you mean the White House? And Carter said, yeah. You've never been in the White House? He said, no. <laughs> and Mondale said, well, I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> it's a nice building. Um, but yeah, Carter was an outlier. And, uh, but you know, he, he actually hit the, the ground running very well. Um, and he got a lot done in that first year. In fact, he submitted uh, too much legislation. Congressional leaders complained. You know, they, he overwhelmed them with legislation on energy, on trade, on immigration. Uh, um, and he also uh, alienated Congress by cutting and vetoing what he called pork. So he vetoed uh, famously as uh, around $5 billion worth of water projects. Um, you know, water projects, uh, Army Corps of Engineer dams and little congressional districts and rural parts of the country that he thought were uh, a waste of money and uh, environmentally uh, suspect. And this, of course, just alienated the congressman who, whose votes he needed to pass some of the tough legislation. Uh, so he he was like Obama. He was. This is a good analogy. Obama also is obviously a very smart, intelligent guy um, who really didn't enjoy the day-to-day -day politics. He didn't like hanging out with politicians. Uh, neither did Carter. He hated these long meetings. He hated wheeling and dealing, making deals with congressmen about getting them, you know, a new highway built or a bridge in their district. Uh, he thought that was unseemly. 
And uh, I can't tell you how many times I interviewed some of his aides where they would say, well, you know, if you wanted to get Carter to do something, uh, just recommend the opposite uh, that it was politically necessary to do. And he would, <laughs> he would make sure that he would, he would not do the politically, uh, the politically feasible. He would run away from it. And his whole attitude in the White House, he was very, it's odd, he, he's, he knew exactly how to win the White House. He knew exactly how to win the governorship of Georgia, what he was necessary to do on the campaign trail. And he could be ruthless in that way and rather cold hearted. But once he achieved power in Georgia and then later in, as a one term governor in Georgia and then as uh, when he got into the White House, his whole attitude was now I have the power. I'm the smartest guy in the room most of the time, I'll study this issue and figure out what is the right thing to do, regardless of the politics. <laughs> so this is you know, uh, an admirable trait in some ways, but it was not politically astute in the long run and maybe helps to explain why he was a one-term president. A um, Couple of things that have been asked in, let me see if I can rephrase them. Um, the Georgia situation in the last presidential election and then the two senatorial elections was quite nationally intriguing, particularly with uh, how, in fact, the uh, people turned out to actually elect the senators. Um, was Carter involved in that at all? Uh, in the recent Georgia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say no. You know, he he was involved to the extent that he uh, endorsed the two Democrats. Um, I think he he had a few Zoom events with them, but you know he was ninety five, going on ninety six years old, and in the last two years he's had um, some serious physical. Uh, problems. He fell walking out of his house in planes on a uh, going out on a turkey right. shoot early in the morning and hit his head and had I think 16 stitches. And um, so he's he's been keeping a lower profile in the last are, are any of the people involved here people who might be considered to be disciplines of his at all? Disciples of his at all? Mm. Not, no, not, neither of the two recently elected senators, no. Uh, he has a major effort to support and analyze democracy, okay, as part. Uh, but he has also been quoted as calling the US more of an oligopoly than a democracy, okay? Yes, yeah, you know, the Carter Center, going back you know, to the early 90s when it became active, um, has had this democracy project for monitoring elections. And so they've sent out teams, and Carter himself has a, a accompanied many of these teams to monitor contentious elections in Africa, Latin America, um, and Asia. Uh, I was in Nepal when he came in 2008 to monitor a cr critical election in Nepal. And he actually played a key role in um, helping that election to be recognized and to, for it to go smoothly. Um, so he's, he's uh, you know, been heavily involved and has a high profile on this issue. And you're right, he has uh, controversially suggested that America in, in recent decades and particularly after the Supreme Court decision about campaign uh, finance. Um, he's argued that big money has made uh, the average voter less and less relevant and that America is, is rapidly becoming more of an oligarchy than a democracy. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's uh, been willing to say a lot of blunt things in, since leaving the White House. Um, 
the peacekeeping work he has tried to do during this period, uh, what, what would you say post-presidential you would give him the most credit for in his work? Well, he played a key role um, in Panama. Uh, he played a key role in Haiti, monitoring elections that were dicey. Um, he um, also has very controversially um, visited Gaza and the West Bank and tried to promote a two-state solution. Um, he's also controversially made uh, three visits to North Korea to try to negotiate uh, a regime where the uh, they abandoned their nuclear weapons program. Um, uh, and, you know, some, some, of these, uh, some of these interventions by Carter were done with the annoyance of the, the, uh, the reigning president. So when Carter went off to North Korea in, 19, in the early 1990s, he did so without Bill Clinton's permission and negotiated a deal that sort of blindsided President Clinton. So he's, he's uh, you know, he's an outlier. He's an, uh, and he's willing to do what he thinks in his judgment is the right thing to do. So his relationship with other ex-presidents is actually a little cool. You notice all the photographs of whenever they get together for an official photo op event. It's, it's funny, Carter always is to one side and uh, uh, there's a, a few feet between him and the rest of the, <laughs> the presidents. Are there any current politicians that you would consider to be disciples? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, our, the, the senator from Vermont is uh, a populist who I think takes a lot of his political uh, philosophy from Carter. Um, yeah, there are a lot of, I think, it's uh, the, the, the Democratic, the sort of progressive wing of the Democratic Party uh, has has a sort of political philosophy that comes from Carter. And this is uh, quite ironic because at the time when Carter was running as a one-term governor from Georgia, he ran as a centrist, even a right of center, um, who, you know, for instance, was... Uh, saying that he was going to institute zero-based budgeting and he was going to balance the federal budget and he was a fiscal conservative. Well, what he really was was a small town fiscal conservative who had a genuine interest in helping the poor, but he didn't want to do it with a lot of money. <laughs> so, uh, liberals sort of at the time and, and particularly sort of Ted Kennedy liberals in the 1970s they couldn't make out what this guy was. Um, and this is part of why Ted Kennedy ran against him. He thought he was too conservative. But in fact, Carter, you know, uh, was just as liberal in many ways as Ted Kennedy. He just spoke a different language. He spoke with that Southern South Georgia accent. Uh, he, you know, didn't make himself understood. He wasn't willing to make the political wheeling and dealing that would have eased his program. Um, so it's, uh, again, it's a sort of a missed opportunity for him. To what extent, if at all, did the uh, strength of his religious feelings get in the way of the uh, uh, long-term solution in Palestine, Israel? Well, it's... <laughs> One of the curious things I had to try to explain in the book was why did Carter, who had no background in the Middle East or experience really, he had one trip to Israel for a week in which he tooled around the country in a station wagon with Jody Powell and, and Rosalind. Um, why did he 
take such high political risks to try to bring about peace in Israel and Palestine. Um, and it comes, the, the only answer you can come down on is that it comes from his religious sensibility. Uh, he was genuinely interested from having read the Bible many, many, many times. Uh, he was interested in the geography of the Holy Land. He uh, thought of it as a tragic conflict that needed to be settled. And so his religious motivation was, that, that was it. Um, it. It helped to steal his determination to make it happen. And that's how Camp David in those 13 days happened. Um, unfortunately, he's been, since leaving the White House, he has, um, with his understanding that the settlements are the problem, they're the obstacle to peace, he has campaigned, you know, and spoken what he calls the truth about the illegal settlements in the occupied territories as a, um, as a, impediment to peace. And this is alienated, um, you know, I think in a, he's been misunderstood. But you talk to many Jewish Americans today and they'll accuse him of being anti-Semitic. Um, and this particularly came about when he, you know, he's written 33 books since he left the White House, <laughs> all sorts of subjects. Um, memoirs, to uh, books about the Middle East, to books about fly fishing and woodworking, one of two of his hobbies. But his, one of his books about the Middle East, he in, had included in the title the word apartheid. And he got a lot of hell for this. Um, and some of his closest aides tried to get him to change the title prior to publication and he refused knowing that it was going to cause controversy, but he wanted people to understand that in his view, the window was closing on a two-state solution and that Israel was headed towards being, to evolving into an apartheid state where uh, the Palestinians would uh, have no political rights. Okay. That's so, yeah, another tragedy. Well, uh... I have known other people who've used the term apartheid with regard to the Middle East and who get told by other people that uh, that's not a good thing to say. Lynn, you had a question or comment. Yeah, Kai, I, I'd like to know um, anything that you might know of um, what Carter might have done to improve uh, or reduce systemic racism while he was governor of Georgia. Were there things that popped out at you? Oh yeah, he uh, again. You know, I I said he was sort of very clever in knowing what he needed to do to get elected governor. Um, so he ran a quote populist campaign where he appealed to rural white voters about their issues, um, but he also campaigned in black churches and. Uh, you know, he was accused by his critics of being sort of uh, hypocritical or even, you know, running right up to the ledge of dog whistles. Mm -hmm. But once he won the election on his very first day in office at his inauguration, he gets up on the platform and he says the time for segregation in the South is over. And he then, his, he used his four years, that they had a, a term limit, so he could only run once. He used his four years in the governor's office to um, do what no governor had done before. He hung the Martin, uh, portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. in the state capitol. He hired thousands of African Americans in the Georgia Civil Service. He appointed judges. Uh, he, you know, spent more money on black communities than had ever been spent before. 
Uh, and he did the same thing when he got into the White House. You know, he, in the spring of 1977, he greatly expanded uh, SNAP, the food stamp program, and uh, eliminated the requirement that you had to buy the, 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 coup, the food stamp coupons, uh, buy a, a packet of them for $75. And he waived the, that requirement and that led to two and then three million additional people on largely African-Americans in Southern states getting food stamps. What role did Rosalind play in the uh, Carter administration? Well, she was, um, she was very much like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in that she was heavily involved. She was, uh, everyone understood that she was uh, one of the few people that Carter listened to. Um, and she actually began to sit in on cabinet meetings, um, taking notes, not speaking, but she would sit in the back and take notes. And, and uh, you know, she would badger Carter so often about this or that policy and what was going on that he finally decided, well, Rosie, you and I are going to have a lunch every Tuesday and uh, we'll, you know, I'll brief you on what's happening and you'll be able to tell me what I should be doing. So <laughs> she was highly influential. <clears throat> In the first year of the presidency, he sent her by herself with a retinue of AIDS on a 10-day uh, tour of Latin America where she sat down with heads of state. And to their astonishment, she had an agenda. It wasn't just, you know, looking at museums and gardens and such. She, she was in instructed to tell some of these military dictators in Peru and Brazil and what not Argentina, that they had to clean up their human rights act, that they had to have elections. I mean, she was uh, a tough cookie. And um, Carter sent her off with this. And it was, he got criticized for doing this. You know, what, it, what is the first lady doing um, high level diplomacy like this? And uh, oddly enough, Carter, hated to do it because this is the longest time he had been separated from Rosalind since they were married. <laughs> and they, uh, they missed each other terribly. You know, their marriage is over 70 years now and it's an incredible marriage and partnership. So they, I have to thank you immensely on behalf of the uh, symposium for your contribution today. I would urge everybody to think about uh, pre-ordering the book on Amazon, which you can do now. And uh, hopefully on June 15th, the uh, shipments from Portugal or wherever uh, are on time to get the book out. 